I'm with Rajendra Abhyankar, former diplomat, former ambassador to Syria, to Turkey, and uh, in charge of, of West Asia in the Ministry of External Affairs. Talmiz Ahmed, India's former ambassador to uh, Saudi Arabia twice, to Oman, as well as the UAE, and Navdeep Suri, former ambassador to the UAE, to Egypt, and Australia. And today we are discussing on the print debates the big uh, reaction in the Arab world against the ru uh, ruling BJP's spokesperson's comments insulting the Holy Prophet. Uh, the BJP has taken action since uh, over the weekend, both these spokespersons, one has been suspended, the other has been expelled, but the Arab world continues to be deeply upset about it. But gentlemen, let me first of all welcome you to the print debates and then we uh, start a discussion. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jadi. Uh, ambassador Ahmed, let me start with you first. You were ambassador uh, to Saudi Arabia some years ago, and uh, Saudi Arabia has come out very strongly. It's the holy custodian of the two mosques in Mecca and Medina. It's come out very strongly against the uh, ruling BJP in India, allegedly the two spokesmen who've insulted the holy prophet. What are your first comments on uh, what's going on? You see, up to now, the policy of the region has been not to comment on domestic issues. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as you know, uh, issues relating to aggravating communal discord is, has been going on for a few years. But uh, in times, uh, in terms of their own policy approach, they do not make comments about domestic issues. Okay. Where you cross the red line is with regard to the Holy Prophet. Holy Prophet is uh, a person who is revered all across the Islamic world. And as you know, there is a long tradition of not tolerating uh, any insult to the Holy Prophet or to his family members. As you will uh, you will recall in this context, all those years ago when Ayatollah Khomeini had issued the fatwa against uh, Salman Rushdie when he had insulted in satanic verses uh, the wife of the Holy Prophet. I, you know, once you insult the Holy Prophet, you are no longer dealing with a domestic matter. You have crossed the line and you are now insulting the entire Muslim community. Okay. You are getting into the scenario relating to Islamophobia, which is a matter of deep concern across the region. So I think this is the background in which this strong reaction has taken place. Uh, Ambassador Suri, uh, can I come to you next and ask you, you've been ambassador in the UAE and in, in, in Egypt, two key uh, states. Both these countries have not said anything so far. We hope that, uh, that this remains like this. But what is the, this reaction that we are talking about? Why do you think... This is so important. And is it different from uh, what these, uh, these Arab states have said previously? I think it's very significant uh, because if you look at uh, just uh, two years and a bit back, uh, when the Article 370 of the Constitution was abrogated on Jammu and Kashmir, I think despite all of Pakistan's best efforts uh, to rouse some kind of support in the Gulf, all of the countries maintained a studied silence um, UAE being one which actually came out with a statement to say that this was India's internal matter. Later, when the Pakistanis tried their level best to get Saudi Arabia and others to act in their favor, use OIC in their favor, they got a, a, a rap on the knuckles. Today, unfortunately, we have uh, shot ourselves in the foot. Ourselves. It's a self-goal. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and so uh, what we are witnessing is, is a reaction uh, to uh, actions within India, which uh, uh, to me are a real setback for the assiduous efforts that the Prime Minister and the government have made uh, to uh, transform our relationship with the Gulf. I mean, this is a fact that in the last five or six years, we have seen a sea change in our relationship with the countries like Saudi Arabia and UAE and others. Right. Uh, today, for the Saudis to be issuing a strong statement, for the Qataris to actually be demanding a public apology, to be coordinating with Kuwait on almost identical statements that they have uh, issued. Um, I think we should be candid in acknowledging that uh, this is a, a diplomatic fiasco. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I think um, indications are that the government has been quick to realize the uh, gravity of it and, uh, and move fairly quickly to initiate some kind of a damage control exercise. Right. Ambassador Abhyankar, you've been an old hand in the Arab world. You've served across the region. You've been uh, secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs handling this region. And I know that you're, you're considered to be 
not just accepted in India, but in the entire region, you're, you're an experienced hand. Now, the fact that Vice President Venkaiya Naidu was in Qatar and the official lunch that was being hosted for him by the Deputy Emir of Qatar was cancelled. Now, the excuse being given was that the gentleman had COVID, but certainly somebody else could have uh, replaced him at that lunch. But the fact that this was cancelled, do you think this is significant? And uh, what's your experience in how the Arab world is reacting to these uh, comments in insulting the Holy Prophet in India? Thank you, Jyoti. <clears throat> what I'll say is I'll take a sentence from Tarniz, where he said that when you make a comment about the Prophet, then actually there are no boundaries. You will have uh, a reaction from the Islamic community all over the world about it. Second, I'll take a comment from uh, Naudeep to say that um, with UAE, we, we hope that there won't be a comment unless things become worse. But in a broad sense, what I'd say is this, that as far as we are concerned, I mean, we diplomats only at the moment are firefighting something that happened in the country. We need to see what is going on in this country at this time. The fact that office bearers, and they are not fringe elements of the BJP can make the kind of comments they have. And the one who is not mentioned is this young man called Tejasvi Surya, who in Australia has compared the Muslim invasion of India to the Holocaust. I mean, the question then arises, that before that, before these people are sent ab abroad, or at least even they're allowed to open their mouths, are they not given any kind of briefing by the BJP? I thought it was an extremely well-organized party. And should that not have been done to have the, uh, to ensure that the spokesman of a party does not go and say things totally against what the prime minister is trying to do? As Navdeep said, um, <clears throat> Prime Minister Modi has taken a lot of trouble since he became Prime Minister since 2015, 2014, when he became, but from 2015, when he started visiting, to actually build excellent contacts with most of the Arab countries, but he has mainly focused on the UAE, on Saudi Arabia, the countries, well, and on Qatar, Kuwait, these are the countries where he's focused on. There is uh, UAE, of course, he's visited the uh, most number of times, but he's been right. to all of them. And there are investments by these countries in India. There are, we are buying their oil. Not that they're going to stop it because of these statements. I don't right. think so. But there is, there has, let us just say that there has been a tremendous effort from the Prime Minister downwards to build a relationship which these people by just, I would say, an unwanted comment, are doing their best to, uh, you know, to ensure that, uh, well, as I said, the relationship won't, but people will not forget. I mean, imagine that something that happened in Holland a long time ago, and it has, it has had reverberations many years later yeah. in many different countries. So you're comparing, so, you're, you're comparing the cartoons against the Holy Prophet. Exactly. That first so, came out in the Arab, in, in the Netherlands yeah. and then subsequently in France. You're comparing that with what's happening today. I'm uh, comparing that with this, that one stray statement, one unwanted statement and one wrong statement can actually ruin a, a very good growing relationship. And if these people cannot understand it, how in the world are they spokesmen and members of parliament, I'd like to know. Uh, Ambassador Ahmed, do you think that that's a bit excessive? Uh, you know, Ambassador Abhyankar is comparing the state, the cartoons, and we saw what happened in Paris um, some years ago, I think it was 2015 and earlier in the Netherlands. Do you think that this is comparable or do you think it's a bit excessive? Not excessive at all. I mean, let us look at what has been happening. You cannot pretend that you can carry out a set of policies at home and the rest of the world will be turning a blind eye. We've had systematic communalization of our political order, the systematic uh, demonization of a particular community, a very substantial community. 
we've had violence on the community and as far as abuse is concerned almost it's almost a daily phenomenon obscure individuals emerge from time to time make some loose communal remark and then get on with it just to get their 2 minutes of fame i would like to say that this is a warning that yes it has had diplomatic reverberations but i would say that uh, you know we've had uh, we've had criticism from the americans as well uh, uh, because of our human rights scenario you i would like to suggest to you that you cannot have double standards you cannot run a political order at home that is abusive that is violative of rights that emasculates our democratic and secular institution and then imagine that the rest of the world is going to carry on with business as usual you have now it has become a pattern it has become a okay. habit for various uh, uh, spokesperson pretending to be spokesperson we don't even know who these people are where they come from and where they are going totally untutored and makes uh, remarks about history about okay. politics about sociology right. about the community i would say that this is a very salutary and timely reminder to the uh, to i mean it is a timely reminder to the political leadership at home that okay. things cannot be business as usual the uh, ambassador uh, suri you've been ambassador in the uae now uae is one of those countries that hasn't said a word so a my question to you is why do you think the uae is keeping quiet and second of all uh do you think that these statements by uh the ruling bjp's former spokespersons will damage india's image abroad or has already so on your first point i think you know the emirati style on something like this would be to uh, have a quiet conversation uh, and convey the message rather than make a public statement i'm not privy to what has happened uh, but that would be more uh, their style particularly given their special relationship uh, uh, with, with india on the larger damage you know um as an arabic uh, language student i was actually uh, going through the twitter timelines of the qatari and uh, kuwaiti foreign office uh, and to see some of the reactions that were uh, coming up and i i have to say uh, it is interesting to see there were three distinct kinds of reactions on uh, the twitter timelines the first was reaction by arabs themselves uh, mm-hmm. and who were not only very supportive of the statements issued by their foreign offices uh, but also fairly critical implicitly explicitly as well of india and the direction in which india is heading so you could see uh, that the average arab who say is one of the 350000 followers of the grand mufti of oman who uh, called uh, uh, the sta- uh, spokesperson statement uh, a war on all muslims uh you know you could see the kind of uh, uh commentary that it is is it is generating the second category was nris indian diaspora that lives in these countries and is obviously worried uh about the impact that something like this can have uh, tangentially on their own uh, well being and and so you saw a number of uh, uh indian nationals uh, living in these countries come out in support of the uh, uh action uh, taken by the host governments and almost trying to distance themselves that hey uh, all of india is not like this uh you know uh, to, to put uh, put some uh, space between them and the uh, kind of statements that have been made okay and the third which was particularly illuminating if you could call it that was the reaction of the right wing trolls uh, who were so abusive of the uh, 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 kuwaitis and the arabs including of the uh, uh, of the uh, qatari assistant foreign minister laula khater uh, who, who had simply retweeted her foreign office statement and i think if these guys had any residual doubts about uh, about where we are going uh, our own trolls have have probably amplified those uh, you know it's so vicious the 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 commentary on some of the timelines that you could see so i think there's no doubt that at a larger level that you're talking about uh, there is a serious um, destruction of indian soft power uh, that okay. is taking place uh, and that image in in the public mind about where india is heading uh, is is probably a greater worry today than it was last week so all three of you gentlemen have made the point that indians india's foreign policy obviously is connected at the naval or or at the ribs with india's domestic policies 
But Ambassador Rajendra Abhyankar, I'd like to ask you, when the Babri Masjid was demolished in 1992, I mean, we've been here before, isn't it? It's not as if this is the first time that, uh, that Indians are, being, are using such you know, terrible language against their own Muslim brothers and sisters at home, and which has had uh, an impact on India's foreign policy. Now, I'd like to ask you about the Babri Masjid's demolition, which became such a big issue abroad. And you know that temples in various countries, including in neighboring Pakistan, were demolished as a reaction to that. So how do you compare? Can you compare it all in the first place uh, with what happened in, back in 1992? Well, I'd like to <clears throat> give you the example of Syria, where I was ambassador when this happened. The Babri Masjid. Yeah. And um, call it whatever you like, but the Grand Mufti of Syria used to give the sermon every Friday to all the mosques. That means no mosque could do anything without the Grand Mufti saying. Mm -hmm. I had cultivated the Grand Mufti enough for him to say when a large number of people of the, of the priests who ran these mosques came and said, we have to say something about the Babri Masjid. He said, no, I'm not going to permit you till I have talked to the Indian ambassador. I happened to be in Delhi for a conference, but the conference never took place because it was on the day that this happened. And we were told, go back to your place because you have to deal with this. Thing. So when I met the Grand Mufti, I explained to him that, look, mosques have been demolished in other countries also, even in Saudi Arabia. And this is a one-time thing. It's not going to happen again. He said, I will ensure that nothing is said about the mosque uh, demolition. Event. So it is a matter, I mean, it's, it's something that one needs to understand that whether it's Babri Masjid or whether there are these odd statements, uh, I mean, these wrong statements made, the fact remains that People in any kind, you know, if it is, if it was indeed, let's say, as the government, and in fact, I saw the statement by our ambassador in Qatar saying that it was a fringe element, that poor fellow, what could he say other than that? But the fact is that these statements were not made by any fringe element. So if these kind of people who hold offices, who hold positions of some kind of representation of the party, if they are not given proper grounding on what is right, what is wrong, because they are ruining something that the leader of their party is engaged in for the last six, seven, eight years. And um, surely somebody in the party must take, I mean, must take, uh, be aware of this and do something about it. But let me just say that this is not going to mean that our relations are going to finish. But what it is going to have, the negative effect is that there are such a large number of Indians living and working Absolutely. in that region. Yeah. Ha these people, did they ever think of how those people, I mean, how are Indians there are going to get treated? Or Because all of them will be pilloried by the local inhabitants saying, uh, And what, what, what does it show? the kind of short-sightedness or ignorance, basically, of these people when they make such statements. So I think all this calls for is, um, is some kind of a training program. I mean, they have all kinds of shivirs. Why don't they have a shivir for all these young MPs to tell them, this is what the Prime Minister is doing. This is our government's policy. So please see that you do not say anything against, which will go against it. Because right. you are going directly doing harm to the Prime Minister. Right. Because right now we have $87 billion of trade with the GCC countries. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's going to stop. They still need to sell us their oil. All this, there are certain imperatives which are not going to change. But it just ruins or at least creates a certain unnecessary, unwanted tension which the diplomats have to go and start fighting instead of doing something positive. So. Right. Uh, Master Ahmed, you know, the point that you made earlier about how domestic policy affects foreign policy, it's a well taken point, which all three of you have made this afternoon. But the question to, to you is that, you know, like Ambassador Abhyanka talked about the Grand Mufti of Syria at the time in 1992, when the Babri Masjid was demolished, 
today as well, the Grand Mufti uh, in Qatar, as well as in Saudi Arabia, and you have served in Saudi Arabia twice. Now explain to me, uh, to my viewers, a little bit about the significance of that. So it's just not the Saudi Foreign Office that's making these statements, but it's the Grand Mufti that's, that's being very critical of what, the, what these um, Indians are saying. I'm going to say something which is troubling. The issues that we grappled with as diplomats earlier, the destruction of Babri Masjid, the communal riots that followed, the, uh, the riots in Gujarat, etc. We all went to the Foreign Office and we made a presentation. But in those days, there was no doubt whatsoever about India's enduring commitment to democracy and secularism. What used to be the response to us is, yes, we have understood what you have said. We see this as an aberration. We know that India remains deeply committed to the welfare of all the communities that make up this great nation. And we know that you will take corrective measures and you will not allow this to be repeated. So whether it was the Babri Masjid or it was the post Godra riots, this was the reaction that we got. Those credentials no longer are valid. Let us be very clear. We have today in India, in New Delhi, a party that is robustly communal, whose fundamental platform is to demonize the Muslim community. And that's and the, and this party has been legitimately uh, elected by the people of India. Absolutely. So but, all... no, I'm aware of that. You don't need to remind me. I'm no. familiar with the political system here. Yes. I am trying to tell you the implications of what is happening outside so, our so body. How are the, so, there yeah. is a concern that India possibly is no longer upholding and is committed to the values that used to define our nation till recently. There is a concern. Do you there agree a, with there's that? A concern voiced, there's Do a concern voiced in Washington and there's a concern voiced in various capitals in our neighborhood. There yeah. is a concern. No, and but the question is that what is this concern that India is no longer is a uh, perhaps, perhaps abdicate the kind of pluralism, accommodativeness, and tolerance that we used to show for all communities, regardless of the aberrations that occurred from time to time, that is today in doubt. As uh, Navjeet has just pointed yeah. out, all yeah. of us have seen those uh, those social media comments. Do That's you think right. that such media comments would have occurred at some time earlier? Do you think any political party spokesperson would have the temerity to speak the way they speak today? Almost on a daily basis, you have abuse emanating from various sources within the political order. Okay. And I at a certain level in the political order. So it is not a question of winning an election. It's a right. question. Uh, and the election that was won was not won on the basis of this kind of abuse. It was Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas, if you remember. Yes. So there is a question, there is a concern which all of us legitimately have. And as to where are we going? Where yeah. are we going with all this? Yeah. And, and these and are, I would say, warnings to us. It is not, I'm not concerned about the diplomatic fallout. Many of these countries are authoritarian regimes themselves. That's and their right. record is not the actually, best in the world. Actually, that was my this point. Is, a, is that this a lot is a of lesson for us about we need to set our house in order. So, Ambassador Suri, that was my point, actually, which is that a lot of these countries in the Arab world, I mean, you know, if they're living in glass houses, how are they expected to throw stones at India? India has been a secular democratic republic through its life, except for uh, through its existence, 75 years now, except for a few years during the emergency. So the point to you is, um, is, is this, is that they're living in glass houses. They're not elected democratic um, countries or nations or regimes. Unlike India. Um, so I think the difference, uh, Jyoti, is that they don't pretend to be democracies. They don't claim to be democracies. They know that they are monarchies, right? There is no, there are no pretensions about that. So I, I, I don't think that they are trying to apply a secular label or a democratic label to themselves, which India has earned over the years. And, 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 and so there's a fundamental difference. But let me just go a, a step beyond to say that. What, what we are seeing, you know, the, 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 there's, you won't see public criticism in, in, in their uh, media because they are not democracies. But friends of India 
have started speaking in private and occasionally in public conversations very recently. There's a very eminent uh, Emirati uh, royal family person, Ambassador Ahmed, I'm sure uh, would have known her. She used to be Minister for uh, Foreign Trade, uh, who at a book launch on a tolerance book, on a book on tolerance, uh, said how disappointed she was about things that she was hearing from India. It's extraordinary, in my opinion, for even an ex-minister to speak on a microphone, uh, something, uh, uh, something to, to that effect. So I think that the change that we are uh, uh, witnessing, Jyoti, is, is, uh, is, is real. Um, governments will continue to do business with each other. But the image of India in the eyes of many uh, it, it is getting tarnished. And I don't know how, what kind of implications that it has. The second point I wanted to make is that while these countries are not democratic or secular, but over the last few years, if there is one clear and visible trend, that is the shift in these countries very publicly to embrace a concept of tolerance. UAE has a high profile member of the royal family as minister for tolerance. They make a big deal of the fact that they're creating this house of Abraham where they'll have a mosque, a synagogue and a, a church in the same complex. Uh, they are actually cleaning up textbooks to remove anti-Semitic uh, uh, references from school textbooks. Uh, we make a big deal of the magnificent Hindu temple that is coming up in Abu Dhabi. We make a big deal of the fact that when Prime Minister went to Oman, he visited the Shiv Mandir uh, outside of Muscat. Uh, look at what is happening in Saudi Arabia. The scale of change which uh, MBS is trying to uh, uh, bring about. In that context, what I think friends of India say is, hey, we are changing towards a somewhat more liberal, somewhat more tolerant uh, environment. And you guys are moving in the other direction. Ambassador Bianca, your comments? Well, um, there seems to be a contradiction. Let us just say that we are still a secular democratic republic because that has not been changed in the constitution. So at least to that extent, regardless of which party is in power, we are required to maintain that secular democratic ethos. And that is getting tarnished, as Nabib said and also Tarmi said, that there has to be something. Otherwise, you just change it and say we are not a secular democratic. Do you think the Prime Minister should speak up, Ambassador Abhyanka, right now? You I, I, I think at this stage, um, if the Prime Minister finds an opportunity to speak, it will be, of course, excellent. Because I think he'll, he should be able to fix this problem once and for all. But if not, at least the Foreign Minister, Mr. Jayashankar, who is extremely astute, should be able to say it. And it does, why, do you think, you, uh, why do you think Mr. Jayashankar has not spoken so far? Why do you think the external affairs minister, Mr. Jay Shankar, a former colleague of yours, a very well-known diplomat, very sharp, very, very astute, as you said, you use that word. Why do you think he hasn't spoken up so far? I think the, they did not, to my mind, they did not uh, realize the way that it is going to just keep go growing this issue. And uh, that is the only reason. They're hoping that it can be settled at some lower level. But the way I see it, I think one can't wait to settle it. It's better if Jai Shankar speaks up and actually I'm, I'm absolutely confident that he'll say exactly what is required. Because the basic thing is that unless you change your constitution, you are obliged to be secular and democratic. And therefore you're obliged to actually deal with the situation as it presents itself in India and ensure that no negative comments are made against any community, you know, any what, religion particularly. You know, what is remarkable actually is that it's taken 10 days for the BJP to sack one spokesperson, Naveen Jindal, to suspend and another there, there you are. Rupur Sharma. Because for the last 10 days, I mean, these comments were not made yesterday or day before, the day before that. They, they were made uh, over a week ago, eight, eight or nine days ago, 10 days ago. So while actually, you know, you have, you've had riots in Kanpur ever since, uh, several people have been injured, but nobody took any action inside the country. It needed 
all these governments in the Arab world, in, this, in the Muslim world, to come out and say these not very complimentary things about India. And this is what is, I mean, that, that's why we're talking about this. So that's quite a, uh, a contradiction in terms too, isn't it, Ambassador Bianca? Of course it is. But, uh, and unless something is done in order to discipline some of these people, to make them understand the larger issues involved, I mean, I'm sure not one of them who made the statement thought of the mi millions of Indians who are working in that region and how will they be affected. If they had even spent one minute on it, they would have said, Ke burna nahi Right. Yeah. So last comments from you, Ambassador uh, Talmiz Ahmed. And my earlier question to you about the significance of the statements by the religious heads, say the Grand Mufti of Mecca and uh, um, in Qatar. How is that significant from what the Saudi Foreign Office has said or the foreign offices of these other countries? As I said in my initial remarks, abusing the, bringing, abusing the holy prophet in any shape or form crosses a red line. And that is why you have seen all this. Uh, rulers as well as the muftis are obliged to intervene in the debate. I, our concern should be what is happening at home. There is now communal discord, communal abuse, communal violence is now the new normal. And the, uh, these various spokespersons or non-entities in their own right have never bothered about any of this. And nor did how, anybody... does this have, how does this have impact on India's foreign policy? Yes. Let the right it, state it is, of India. It is Does not it a foreign impact? policy issue alone. Foreign policy issues have already been agitated. I mean, people have accepted. This is, I would say to you, it's a concern for the national policy. We have to worry about what the state of our own country is. Rather, foreign policy is another matter. And I think my colleagues have pointed out, it may not immediately have any negative effect, but it will tarnish the image of the country. This is What we are demanding and what my two colleagues have also echoed is that there needs to be a fundamental change of approach at home where we have to get rid of this new normal. When we speak of prime minister and foreign minister, they have to give a message which the RSS chief has already given that we are one nation. That is a message that must reach down to the rank and file and it should be actually obeyed and they should lead from the front in this regard. You cannot have it both ways. You cannot have communal violence and abuse on the one hand and imagine you are going to look good throughout the world on the other. It's not going to happen. Ambassador Suri, your last comments. Jyoti, just a couple of points. One, I think uh, what Ambassador say, uh, Ahmed says is hate speech has been normalized. It is no longer seen as an exception. It happens right. every night on our television screens. Some of our anchors are willing partners and abettors to that uh, phenomenon of hate speech. And that message travels around the world. We live in a world of seamless uh, communications. The uh, second thing I would say is, that if a uh, punitive action isn't taken against those who cross the red line, cross the boundary. But it cross... has been taken. Don't you think it's been taken? I, 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 I think it's a very small first step. And I, I fear that it might be a case of too little, too late, because the rot has spread down the line. Uh, earlier, there was a reference to Tejasvi Surya by Ambassador uh, Abhyankar. You have a long memory, 2015. He put out some really wild tweets about the sexuality of Muslim women. That's, uh, that's and, 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 and then that issue surfaced in 29 and there was an online spat that he had with a member of the UAE royal family. Uh, and, 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 you know, that's again uh, something all over the media. You Today, if, if action had been taken at that time, a slap on the wrist at least, then maybe he wouldn't have embarrassed us in Australia. But because no action is taken, because he thinks it's normal to say such a thing, we find ourselves in the embarrassing situation in foreign policy terms as a consequence of what we are unable to fix domestically in India. I, I, I'm saying my, my fear is that the rot has spread deep. And unless a message goes not only to these spokespersons, uh, but down the rank and file, if in doubt, just look at what the Twitter timelines are saying from the trolls. It is widespread. It is not a fringe. If it's a sprint, fringe, it's a very large fringe today. Uh, and, and, you know, I was thinking 10 years back, the tea cup Tea Party in America was a fringe, and then it became Trump's base in a decade. So you feel take that long for a fringe to transition into mainstream? Be careful. Uh, we need to act, act now. Otherwise, you know, we can't afford to be complacent. 
So you feel Prime Minister Modi must speak up and stem the rot and and make an example must, of some people. He must speak up. The Home Minister must speak up. Uh, a message from the head of the IT cell should go to his uh, troops uh, uh, saying back off. A lot is needed. This is only a very small first step. And, 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 and it will have to be followed through with a lot more substantive action. Ambassador Bhyankar, would you, did you want to say something? I just wanted to say one word that a vice president has been in Qatar. I hope and I'm sure he will when he comes back ensure that something more, um, more fundamental is done as far as this whole issue is concerned. Right. I think we'll have to leave it there. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. But I do want to say here um, to, the, to the comment that the prime minister must speak up, the home minister must speak up, the external affairs minister must speak up about what's going on here and to stem the rot before it's too late. Thank you all for your time. And uh, thank you for joining me on the print debates. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you.